two lectures ago, I talked about critical theory and mentioned that one of the most important strands of critical theory is feminism. In the late 20th century and early 21st centuries, many women have challenged male domination of art and what they see as a male gaze that dominates and distorts artistic depictions of women and especially their bodies. This artist used to be a college board favorite. The video clip that references it is a little outdated, but it introduces some important elements of feminist art. You'll see this work and several earlier Cindy Sherman self-portraits. Here's an old College Board essay question on this work. The artist overlaid a photograph of the head of a classically beautiful female with cut and pasted, that's a sculpture, and cut and pasted text that challenges the male gaze. Appropriates is a term you need to know. It means borrowing, but also frequently substantially repurposing earlier works of art. You'll often hear the term today applied to borrowing from other cultures. So Picasso appropriated African masks and Demoiselle d'Avignon. Here's what the College Board says in its scoring guide for this old question. And by the way, the same analysis could be applied to Cindy Sherman's Untitled 228 and Wangechi Mutu's Praying Mantra. Feminist art historical explorations of the male gaze examine the asymmetrical power relationship between men and women in society. In particular, feminists examine the ways women are viewed as passive and thus robbed of agency, that is, the ability to act and make decisions for themselves. In Kruger's work, which is technically a photograph, the profile of the woman passively invites the gaze, while the words actively deflect or return that gaze. Do you remember this painting from an earlier unit? It was actually commissioned by a Queen of England who wanted an accurate rendering of the gallery, but the work also captures the male gaze. Back in the same unit, we also contrasted the classical subject of a male gaze, Titian's Venus, with a 19th century courtesan who most decidedly chose to gaze back. So, is Olympia just another more blatant example of the male gaze? After all, it's probably a man who's just walked in the door to look at her, right? Or is this, in fact, a feminist painting because she gazes back? I think my own answer would be some of both. In her so-called film stills, they aren't actually taken from real movies, Cindy Sherman poses herself in various stereotyped female roles. Like Barbara Kruger, she challenges the male gaze, but she does it by confronting the viewer with their own preconceptions. Remind you of another artist we've seen? Kara Walker also explores stereotypes by confronting her viewers with their own interpretation of and response to these images. In this work, Faith Ringgold pretty clearly challenges the Aunt Jemima stereotype. Her Aunt Jemima is a successful businesswoman. But what about these works from the French collection? Our heroine, Willa Marie Simone, makes it big in Paris, but she does it by submitting herself to the male gaze as an artist model. Paris in the 1920s welcomed African-American artists and musicians, especially jazz musicians, but they were viewed a little like Picasso's African masks, exotic, powerful, beautiful, but maybe a little dangerous, and distinctively the other, something perhaps to be gazed upon, even something to be possessed. Anyway, back to Cindy Sherman and our next required work. Here are more of her photographic images, some of which you also saw in the video. All of these, I think, make the point that Cindy Sherman sees women as constantly performing, living out roles expected of them by others, maybe expected of them by themselves. You all remember the story of Judith and Holofernes, right? The history portrait series, like the untitled film clips, is both homage and satire directed toward famous old paintings. Here I've ju juxtaposed Cindy Sherman's photograph on the Botticelli painting that she has appropriated. What similarities and differences do you see? Well, the clothing is very similar, although Botticelli's heroine seems to be wearing sandals on much smaller feet. The faces, likewise, are both rather demure, which I find odd, given our heroine's bold and gruesome act. But Cindy Sherman's expression is a little scary, or maybe a little unhinged. As for differences, Botticelli's Judith is a dainty young Italian aristocrat. Remember Florence's sentimental attachment to biblical underdogs, Judith and David? Cindy Sherman's Judith, by contrast, is enormous. She also looks like she just came out of a costume store and did not max out her credit card. Khan Academy uses the adjectives tacky, chintzy, and cheap for her clothing and makeup. Fair enough. So what do you make of a Halloween mask Holofernes? What point do you think the artist is making here? 
I'm going to flash a few more of her photographs juxtaposed. Ah, that wonderful, useful word again with paintings that she may or may not be imitating. Here is Cynthia's Bacchus next to Caravaggio's version, the Sick Bacchus. Many art historians believe this is a self-portrait of Caravaggio when he was recovering from malaria or maybe liver disease or maybe a kick from a horse. And that's Cindy Sherman on the left, Raphael's La Fornarina on the right. The woman in the painting was probably Raphael's lover, Margarita Ludi. At any rate, she is clearly meant to convey idealized female beauty. And how does Cindy Sherman play with this? Look closely at the photo. She has strapped, strapped on fake plastic breasts and a fake stomach. If you look at the shoulders, you see the joints clearly exposed. What points do you think she might be making about the female body? about artificial enhancements, and about the relationship between art and photography. I don't have answers to these questions, by the way, but I think the Judith photograph raises many of the same issues. If you have time, here's a short video clip of Cindy Sherman discussing why she photographs herself in all these roles. And now we turn to female artists who are more interested in exploring the female body, and more specifically, the female body in relationship to nature. Kiki Smith trained as an EMT as well as an artist, and her early work shows her fascination with human anatomy. Many of her works also focus on body fluids, breast milk, as shown here, and also urine and menstrual blood. She often seeks to expose and break down social taboos, especially those that hide the working of the female body. In the mid-1990s, her artistic interest turned toward nature, and she discovered that drawing and etching helped her capture the delicate nature of feathers and fur. She also became more interested in the iconography and symbolism attached to animals and the role of animals in fairy tales and religious narratives. You recognize this fairy tale, right? Lying with the Wolf also has its origins in a narrative, sort of. I've put the artist's own description of her inspiration up on the slide. St. Genevieve was a young girl who lived in France in the last days of the Roman Empire. Her prayers as a teenage nun were credited with turning Attila the Hun away from Paris, and she remains the city's patron saint. So I tried, without success, to find the work Kiki Smith refers to on the Louvre website. I wonder if she was maybe referring to this Flemish work, which is hung in another Paris art museum. Anyway, as far as I can tell, the main association between St. Genevieve and wolves is that the saint protected her sheep by keeping the wolves of Attila from the door. Oh well. The story clearly resonated with Kiki Smith. It's a story of female power and a story that, of that power being used to bring peace. Kiki Smith was raised Catholic and continues to be very interested in both Catholic and Buddhist thought. She told one interviewer, quote, My whole life I've wanted to believe in a God, find some kind of God that I could make a shrine to. I can't. I never do, unquote. Clearly, her Catholic upbringing has influenced Kiki Smith's art. If you have time, it would be interesting to stop and talk about this quote and how it might relate to other works we've studied in this course. So, let me ask a question that I don't usually indulge myself by asking. What do you think of this work, and why? And here's why I asked. I have a confession to make. I find this work irritating. I realize that the artist is making a point about living in peace with nature and female spiritual power. But my somewhat snarky reaction is this drawing is insulting to wolves, and maybe women too. Wolves are beautiful, deadly, fierce, loyal, but they are not cuddly. And I'm all about women acting with power and confidence, but if one of my daughters decided she wanted to snuggle up with a wolf, I would schedule an appointment with a therapist. Okay, I've vented. This artist is also exploring female power, but she puts her female figure into a very different relationship with nature. Remember this image from the first week? Praying mantis females devour their mates after sex. But the insect imagery goes beyond ferocious female power. The word mantis derives from the Greek word for prophet or diviner. We actually spell the insect's name with an A, a reference to its stance, which some people think resembles prayer. Mantra is a religious chant, not an insect. So is this woman looking for dinner, or is she looking for the meaning of life? Maybe both. Wangechi Mutu is a female artist from Kenya who now lives and works in New York. Her works are often described as cyborgs. So science fiction fans, what does that mean? Okay, I'm going to read from a scholarly paper on her work. Sorry if that seems like a cop-out, but I'm going to admit freely that I find this work 
puzzling, intriguing, but puzzling. So here we go. Wangechi Muda's collages on paper and mylar, that is the polyester film, the stuff balloons and uh, balloons and bouquets are made of, often presents female figures composed of human, animal, object, and machine parts. Let me just interject, that's what cyborg means. Among the sources for her mismatched fragments and decorative patterns are pornographic, fashion, travel, and automotive magazines, in addition to colorful coffee table books on African art produced by and for Western audiences. Mutu fuses an assortment of body parts and extremities with hand-drawn and painted elements. It is often the female body in an endless variety of new formations that she chooses to construct. In so doing, she provides a transcultural critique of the female persona as dramatized and represented in Western culture. So, to recap, this work engages with gender roles and ethnic and cultural stereotypes. <coughs> Excuse me. Mutu is especially interested in the way black female bodies have been stereotyped and exploited. But this female surely is equipped to fight back. Not sure I'd want to mess with the horned woman on the right, either. And here's a quote from the author. The work on the right is entitled Cancer of the Uterus, and it's actually a pathology diagram overlaid with glitter and a woman's eyes and lips. So, how do these works combine the desired and the despised? And here's still another intriguing quote, and further collages by the artists that demonstrate female power, vulnerability, and stereotyping. The artist actually made a film starring one of her cyborg creatures. I hope you have time to watch a part of the video in which she discusses the work and shows us a little of what looks like a weird and wonderful movie. Our final artist of the day, Magdalena Abakanovitz, is also a female artist and also explores the human body. But as the title Androgyne 3 suggests, her bodies are conspicuously neither male nor female. They are merely, if incompletely, human. So what message do you think the artist is sending with these dramatic, incomplete figures? Bodies without skulls, bodies without heads, torsos without legs, and why are they hollow? Well, to start with the last question, Abakanowicz saw her family home attacked by Nazis and then seized by Soviet occupiers. Here's a quote from the artist about that experience. As our home and countryside receded, by the way, this was Poland, I felt increasingly hollow as if my insides had been removed and the exterior, unsupported by anything, shrank, losing its form. This short video clip not only talks about Magdalena Abakanovitz's background, but also gives you a look at some of her early work. Abakanowitz spent some time working in a hospital and later studied human anatomy. This experience may offer another reason for her rather strange choice of medium. Pieces of coarse burlap, which she sewed and pierced, pieced together, bonding the sculpture with synthetic resin. The rough texture captures some of the look of internal organs, muscles, and veins. Here again are the artist's own words. After many years, soft things of complicated tissue have become my material. I feel a kinship with a world which I do not want to know, but through touching, feeling, and relating to the part of myself, which I carry deep inside me. In, in another interview, she refers to, quote, man's horrible powerlessness against his biological structure. Here's another set of works that captures that effect especially well. In fact, I think the College Board's chosen example of Abakanovitz's work leaves out an important dimension of that work and of her message. Usually her hollowed out and incomplete human figures appear in large anonymous groupings. Because she hand molds each figure, each individual sculpture is unique, yet the impression is one of an anonymous crowd. Here again is an explanation from the artist. I happened to live in times which were extraordinary, times of collective hate and collective adoration. Crowds worshipped leaders, apparently great and good, who soon became mass murderers. So, perhaps our androgynous figures are not merely victims, but also perpetrators of global tragedy. Let me just note that she sometimes cast her work in bronze. Here is a recent example in the same distinctive style. Whew! Almost there. In my final lecture, we will finish up our required works, move on to the last unit test, and then the AP 